and we'll get going. All right, welcome. Happy Saturday morning. Uh, thank you to all who have attended. Thank you to Catherine for doing this program. Uh, as soon as I saw that her book came out, uh, as a friend on Facebook online, I messaged her and said, you have to come to the library and do this. But we're doing it through Zoom, so it, it's all good. Uh, she, however, is out there camping and enjoying the outdoors where I'm stuck inside here. But uh, it should be a good time either way. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm Desiree Smelser, the adult services librarian at the South Hadley Public Library. Um, this month I decided is going to be an author book talk month. So not only do we have an amazing program that's going to be going on today about, about the Belchertown State School, we're also going to have a fun California romance authors symposium with three authors, one that's contemporary, one that's time travel, and one that's just Western. Um, and that's going to be on Wednesday, October 14th at 630. We also have a memoir by Jack Safel about his marriage to Danielle, who was deaf and blind. And that'll be on Saturday, October 24th at 11 o'clock. Um, just a little side note, that's actually my father. So uh, I, we actually will have some um, photographs and some um, other fun stories to be able to tell and apparently a few embarrassing stories about me. So that'll be nice too. Um, <laughs> and uh, last but not least, we have a program on Halloween called the 100 Greatest Cartoon Characters of All Time that are ranked from zero to, uh, from 100 to number one. That's gonna be on Halloween at 11 o'clock, which is a Saturday, by Martin Gitlin. And you can sign up for these programs on our website um, at shadleylib.org. And um, just go under October programs and you'll be all set. So now I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Katherine Anderson. Uh, she is an award-winning author of two historic mysteries, uh, Hospital Hill, which was a really fun, good book, and Shadows of the in the Ward. And she was born in 1980 in Western Mass. She's a special education teacher. Um, for many years, Kate worked in painstaking research and to document the, document the insane asylums and state schools in New England and publishing nonfiction works and lecturing on the history of mental illness. So one little side note, if you don't know, she's also a wonderful photographer. So if you ever get a chance to look at her photography, you really got to because it's really cool and beautiful. So everyone, please welcome Katherine Anderson. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you real quick. So give me a moment. Um, we all know how fun technology is right now. Um, and let's see, hang on one second, I gotta get the right tab up. My computer is doing whatever it feels like doing today. Of course, you know, to go along with the leaf blowing, why not? Let's see. Of course. <laughs> of course, of course. You can't ever just be simple, right? All right, so well, let me throw this in present mode. And we're off. Excellent. So hopefully everybody can see this okay. Um, I'll give you a little bit more background about myself. I have been in special education for 20 years now. And I started my career in institutions. I started off in residential treatment facilities. And a lot of the folks that I worked with had started their careers at Belchertown State School, some at Northampton State Hospital. And I've always had a major addiction to history in general. And I've also always loved abandoned buildings. I can remember being a kid and taking rides on Sundays with my parents. And the whole purpose of those rides was to see how lost we could get and see if we could find some abandoned buildings. Uh, my grandmother especially was addicted to abandoned buildings and I remember being about maybe seven and her teaching me how to jimmy open a door with a metal coat hanger so she could see inside of an abandoned farmhouse. So when I started teaching in institutions and I found out that the residential I was at had connections to these larger institutions, um, a friend of mine said, you know, we should go check out Northampton State Hospital before they tear it down. So we had gone, we took a look at it. Um, of course, I went inside because I had to. Uh, but shortly after, someone else said, you know, there's another place kind of like that. Have you ever heard of the Belchertown State School? And I hadn't. And I didn't know anything about state schools, what they were, that they even existed. So we actually took a ride over there 
And the first time I saw it was in 2006, and it was the first snow of the, the year. And it was nighttime, because when else would you go to an abandoned building? Um, and all we were able to do was walk around a little bit, but immediately I needed to know what the history of this place was. And back then, there were only a couple of books available about the state school. So I read Ben Ricci's book, Crimes Against Humanity, followed by Ruth Sinkwitz Mercer's book, I Raised My Eyes to Say Yes. Both amazing books, if you haven't read them already. And of course, because we had the internet, I did as much research as I possibly could. Um, I found a couple of websites, first Opacity, then Asylum Projects, where they detailed a little bit of the history of the state school. Um, and I decided that that was what I wanted to write about. I've always been a writer. I love writing. Um, and I could never really find the subject that I wanted to focus on. And this became it. So this is an aerial view of the entire state school campus. So this is what I saw the first time I went to the state school. All of the buildings were there and still intact with the exception of two. And about two weeks after we had gone the first time, there was a rash of vandalism and all of the buildings were popped open. So I took the opportunity to go inside and I photographed these buildings from top to bottom in a span of about 13 years. So I have um, tens of thousands of photographs of this campus dating all the way back to 2006. So in 2013, I launched a Kickstarter campaign and I'm going to let the video speak for itself. Kate, is there sound for the video or is it just quiet? Is it not playing the sound? No, it's not. Oh God, yes, there is sound. Okay. Hang on a second. Let me um, check the video settings. Sorry, everyone. No problem. It's... Audio, let's see. All right, well, I am not 100% sure why the audio is not working. That's okay. What I will do is if folks want to watch that video, I can link it so that folks can watch it later. How's that? Sounds good. I'll put okay. that in the email as the attachment with the video uh, when I send things out on Tuesday. Sound okay? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, because I can't open the chat while a video is playing, so I didn't see the chat lighting up. <laughs> no problem. No problem. But yes, I will send that out to folks. Um, you know, we're, we're destined to have at least one, um, you know, one failure. It's all right. <laughs> one technological failure. So that was the video that I had posted for my Kickstarter. There is an audio overlay that actually talks about the history of the state school and um, kind of guides you through the tour of the campus that you'll see in the video. So the Kickstarter 
project that I posted in 2013 was fully funded, but once it was funded, I didn't really know where to go with it. Um, UMass actually declined the project. They wanted nothing to do with my manuscript, which kind of surprised me since they published Robert Hornick's book, The Girls and Boys of Belchertown. Um, so it kind of sat in a drawer for many, many years until I started my Master of Fine Arts degree and I ended up writing my thesis about Belchertown State School. And at the time I had already written two books for Arcadia Publishing, um, one on the history of Danvers State Hospital and one on the history of Westboro State Hospital. So I pitched them the Belchertown State School book and they went for it. So the interesting thing about this particular volume is that it actually only covers the history of the state school up until 1960 because there was so much information and so many images that I was able to use that we couldn't fit the entire history of the state school. So right now we're working to have Arcadia agree to a second volume, which hopefully there will be a decision in February for a second volume of the book, so I can cover the remaining history of the state school. So let's talk a little bit about state schools in general, what they are and why they exist. So initially in Massachusetts, the what they called the feeble-minded, and I remember the terms were very different back then, they're terms that we would never use today, but it's what they had then. <clears throat> feeble-minded children, children with any kind of disability were largely excluded from school because people assumed that they couldn't be educated. They assumed that they couldn't be trained and there was no point in sending them to school and taking up space in the classrooms that typical children would need. However, um, eventually the family structure changed and parents weren't as eager to keep their children at home, especially if they had disabilities. And if there were older folks with disabilities in the community as well, families were very reluctant to keep them at home as, as well. So in the late 1800s, Samuel Gridley Howe, who was a well-known educational reformer and the president of the Perkins School for the Blind, was asked to go out into communities in the state of Massachusetts and survey how many children were being kept at home as opposed to being sent to school. And he found that close to 600 children just in the areas that he surveyed were not attending school. So he proposed that he be given an opportunity to take 10 of those children, bring them to a disused wing of the Perkins School for the Blind, and start to teach them. He firmly believed that children with disabilities were able to be educated just like every other child. So he started his experiment. It was exceptionally successful. So they gave him his own building in South Boston. And Eventually, that school grew to the point where it needed its own location. You can see this bottom picture, the sepia toned picture, is an early photo of the Walter E. Fernald State School, which was originally called the Massachusetts School for the Feeble Minded. And it was relocated to Waverly in Waltham. And the school population grew to the point where just a few years later, the Rentham State School, pictured here in black and white, opened a few years later to take the overflow from the Fernald School. However, they did discover very quickly that many of the students that were on the waiting list to get into both Fernald and Rentham were actually from Western Mass. Now, Western Mass had Northampton State Hospital, but they didn't have a state school for the feeble-minded. So the state announced the plan to open a state school in the Western region. That sparked a competition of sorts between a number of towns, including Holyoke, Westfield, and the town of Colrain, which is in the, the hill towns, way out in the hill towns, and also Belchertown. The charge for Belchertown was led by Daniel Dwight Hazen, who was a leading entrepreneur in the town, and he saw the value of having this business of sorts be located in Belchertown. He lobbied very hard for it to be located there because it was a nice rural farming community where they knew that having this type of institution would generate a lot of money for the town. People would be coming and going to visit their family members at the state school. And while they were coming through, they would likely stop and spend money in the town. He was looking at it from a purely um, monetary standpoint as most people didn't really understand what a state school was and what it did. But in the long run, his persistence paid off and Belchertown won out over Holyoke and Westfield. So initially when they decided to put the school in Belchertown, they could not find a viable water source. So in 1915, when they were ready to open the school, 
they couldn't start construction, so instead they opened just the farm. They had acquired five family farms totaling close to 900 acres, and a group of students, which you can see right here in this sepia tone photograph, these were the first students to come from the Rentham State School. Rentham served as the parent institution for Belchertown for many years until they got their own superintendent and their own budget. So this first group of students were referred to as inmates and their matron and master were referred to as their wardens. They came from Rentham. They moved into the Jepson house, which you can see down here, pictured in 1920. And they began farming the land to get ready for whenever they could find a water source and start construction on the hill. It took them a few years, but they finally found a viable water source. And the next photo that I'm gonna show you you guys are exceptionally lucky because this one is not in the book. I tried to put in a few special photos that were not in the book that no one else will get to see except you folks who attended today. Um, this is a beautiful panoramic photo of the beginnings of construction up on the hill when they started to build the main campus. So they finally found a water source. They could finally start construction and they started off with a couple of dorms for staff, a couple of dorms for the patients and also a storehouse and a powerhouse. And eventually they needed to find their own superintendent and they needed to separate from Rentham State School. Rentham was only supposed to be their parent institution for a little while and they helped make some of the decisions and get the construction going but eventually they chose Dr. McPherson, George E. McPherson, who's pictured right here. Behind him is actually the Belchertown State School uh, car. The Commonwealth used to provide them with a car and it has a nice little seal of Belchertown State School on it. And he was chosen because he had worked uh, in the Department of Mental Health for a very long time, he was actually the pretty much the right hand man for the individual who ran the entire department. So when they chose him as the first superintendent, they did so because they had enormous confidence in him and what he could do for the students. And he believed, just like Samuel Gridley Howe, that all of these individuals with disabilities could easily be educated. The whole purpose of Belchertown State School when it opened in 1922 was to take these individuals in, train them and educate them in a very intensive fashion because they would be living there and then return them to their homes. Belchertown was never meant to be a permanent residence and it was never meant to be anything more than a temporary interruption in a person's life that would help them get back into society. Some of the individuals who came who didn't have families were then fostered out to families who were willing to take them um, and they were found jobs. They had the support of a social worker that would go out and check on them and they had the support of all of the individuals that worked at the school. It was a very different atmosphere than what we are used to hearing about. This is one of the early campus plans drawn up in 1931 and these are all the buildings that were constructed and exactly where they ended up. Um, so they did follow through on their plan. Uh, the only buildings that no longer existed by the time I saw it was A Ward here and K Ward here, which were demolished in the 1970s. However, um, with the success of the state school under McPherson's leadership, there was talk about possibly expanding the campus, but that never happened. Instead, McPherson spent most of his time going out and lecturing at different schools and different gatherings to help educate people about folks with special needs. In fact, McPherson did a series of lectures at the High School of Commerce, where I am now the special education coordinator, um, and he was helping teachers learn how to best support students with disabilities in their classrooms so that they could cut down on the number of students that were referred out to a place like Belchertown State School. McPherson was very careful to ensure that the students who were taken in at the state school absolutely needed their services as opposed to constant referrals from the schools because teachers felt they couldn't handle those students in their classrooms. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, eventually there was a plan to expand. They planned to build a second um, hospital building right behind this X-shaped building. They also planned to build a number more of these cross-shaped dorms all across this ridge here, but none of that ever came to fruition. All right, so let's talk about some of the more important buildings on this campus. Not that they're not all important, but some of them are slightly more important. 
Um, originally, there was no administration building on the campus. Um, the superintendent's office was actually in the storehouse next to the bakery, and it was very difficult for people to find. So they would come in the front of the campus and have to drive all the way to the back to the storehouse to find the superintendent. However, he remarked in a couple of his reports that he really did like being in that building and smelling all the baking bread all the time because he said it was very nice and very homey. But in 1927, they did begin construction on a dedicated administration building, which you can see the construction photo up in the corner here, and a photo of the finished building, which is probably one of my favorite photographs of that building. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about the administration building a little later. The second most important building to be constructed in the next year in 1928 was the schoolhouse, which is probably the building that most people recognize as Beltertown State School. Um, when you think about the state school, the schoolhouse is the anchor of the campus. It was built right in the middle. But originally, all class, classes and any kind of performances or activities were held in the laundry building. They had carved out a side of the, the laundry that was a makeshift auditorium classroom space, but it became so overcrowded. There were no windows, so it was dark, and the teachers were complaining that they couldn't do their best work with the students in an environment like that. So they started construction on the schoolhouse. The schoolhouse wasn't completely finished until 1932, but by the time it was done, it had an entire floor of classrooms. It had the beautiful auditorium that you can see with all the seats set up. Um, it had a gymnasium in the basement, and it also had a really beautiful employee recreation room, which is down in the lower corner of the slide. Um, in the auditorium, they showed movies weekly, they had shows, they had plays that were all put on by the patients, um, and a lot of the costumes were made by the patients and the props, um, and they also held religious services, all of which were open to the public. So a lot of the townspeople would join for these activities. As the campus grew, there were more buildings that were built. Um, the, this building up in the corner here is the, one of the industrial buildings. There were two, one for boys, one for girls, where the girls would learn things like um, hygiene and hairdressing and um, embroidery, linen making and linen repairing. So they would do things like hemming the sheets and sewing the pillowcases and things like that. The boys would learn how to make brushes and brooms. They would learn how to repair shoes. They would learn to do woodworking. And a lot of what was done in the industrial buildings actually went out onto the campus and was either used in the buildings or it was sold at some of their industrial exhibitions or at the Belchertown Fair. Um, a good deal more housing was built for the employees because their employee census grew as their patient census did. That's these little white cottages with the cute little front porch. Um, and they added a cafeteria slash canteen and major massive industrial sized kitchen that provided food for both staff and clients. Um, there were many other buildings that were added later, including a hospital and a couple of infirmaries. So the buildings are interesting. The architecture in some cases is very beautiful. And the buildings eventually were all that was left of the campus. But the important part of the campus is the people, especially the patients, the residents, the clients, however they were to be referred to um, as the, the terms changed over time. Every patient when they were admitted was recorded on a ward card back when the school first opened. Obviously they were done by hand, eventually they were done by computer in the late 80s before closure, but this is an example of one of the ward admission cards for a child that was admitted in 1935. And you can see the interesting part is that this child is only three years old in 1935. However, this child had microcephaly, which means they had a smaller than normal sized skull, which put pressure on the brain and generally does not allow for any kind of normal development for a child. So this is a child that it would be very obvious looking at them that they were disabled. And it says speech defective, which means this child likely couldn't speak or communicate and it would diminish all of that child's cognitive functioning. So there was nothing typical about this child. So a parent who has a child like this would likely go to their pediatrician and the pediatrician would say, well, your child is not going to meet any of the normal milestones for development. So your best bet is to send them to Belchertown where they have specialized care. 
So since this kiddo was only three years old, this child would have gone directly to one of the nurseries that had been built on campus. There were two nurseries that were built to care for small children. Initially, Dr. McPherson didn't have any plans to accept children under the age of seven, but by the mid 1930s, it was clear that children under the age of seven were the largest population that needed this level of care. <clears throat> so, um, hang on a second, it looks like one of my slides is out of, oh, there we go, I skipped one by accident. So one interesting thing is this picture here of these four girls that are standing together. These are actually four sisters. There were five in all, and all five were committed to some institution of some sort. There was Hattie, who was the oldest. Then there was Alice, Martha, Laura, and Emma. And all five of these sisters were committed to institutions. In reading their, their histories, it turns out that they were committed to institutions because their parents were unemployed and their parents were also uneducated. So the girls were uneducated because they were living at home and helping to work the, the land with their parents. Most of the children who were admitted to state schools would not today be considered disabled. They would not be considered quote unquote feeble minded. They would not be considered quote unquote retarded they would just be children who needed extra support in the school system. But back then, when we had children who were largely uneducated and the public schools were overrun by children like this, these kids got referred to social services. And back then, the social services network was not very big. So the state schools stepped in and became part of that social services chain. And they often took in children who were runaways, children who were constantly truant from school, um, I've seen a couple of records that were of children who liked to pull the fire alarm frequently. Um, children who were just general behavioral problems and frequently children who were involved in the court system and had legal issues would also be sent to the state schools for support, um, which is very interesting because we think of state institutions as just places where um, they're just taking in people who are ill in some way or shape or form, but they also served a very important purpose as far as helping supporting people with behavioral issues. Um, and here comes another photo that is not in the book that only you get to see. Um, this is a picture of a pairing class that was being held in one of the service buildings in 1929. And this is where they took some of the female patients and taught them how to peel vegetables and fruit. Um, you can see the architecture in this building is very industrial, but at the same time, you can see these huge, beautiful sinks that were probably soapstone. Um, and these, were, these children were learning how to do a skill that the school believed would take them back out into society and give them an opportunity to find a um, well-paying job and give them a foundation for going back out to their homes and back out to their home and schools. So, one of the things that the school was very keen on doing was making sure that they were providing as many opportunities as possible for these children. Now remember, this is the early days of the state school when there was a good deal of money available. There was also a good deal of support for what the state school was doing because they were sending children home. People could clearly see that there was a success rate that matched what the state had said. Very often the state will say, you know, oh, we're, this particular program is going to turn out this many graduates and they're going to be capable of doing this and then we don't see the results. But in this case, in the early 1920s into about the early 1940s, the state school was doing exactly as it promised. It was sending children home with more skills than they had when they came into the school. They also provided a ton of recreation activities. This is a picture of a 4th of July picnic in the 1930s. The 4th of July picnic and parade were held every year, um, all the way up until um, the 1970s. And they also held, um, they held parades and picnics for other holidays as well, Memorial Day, Labor Day, things like that. They also hosted a yearly Christmas pageant, which again was produced by the patients with the help of some of the staff. Um, they also held industrial exhibitions where the students were allowed to show off what they had done in the industrial buildings, some of the weaving that they had done or the embroidery. 
um, they also got to show off some of their skills with things like um, how they learned how to make a bed or how they learned how to tie their shoes. Um, it may seem like small things to us, but for a child with disabilities, this was a great opportunity for them to show the adults what they had learned. Um, there was also swimming, there was ice skating, they used to do sleigh rides, they would take all the children up to the, um, the Belchertown Fair. And in fact, after taking the children to the Belchertown Fair, they loved the rides so much that the superintendent, in this case, the second superintendent, Dr. Henry Tagel, um, with the help of the Belchertown State School uh, Parents Association, raised enough money to purchase a carousel just for the patients at Belchertown State School. And the day that they opened the carousel, they, opened, they invited the, the children from the entire town and they all came. They went on rides, they had a little celebration, they had a parade, um, and they had movie shows at night. And again, the public was welcome to all of their events. Now, unfortunately, I think we all know the end of this story. So after Dr. McPherson had served for a number of years, he served from 1922 until 1945, his post was taken by Dr. Henry Tagel, who had been a superintendent at Redford State School. He had spent quite a number of years at Rentham, and when he was chosen to replace Dr. McPherson, I think, and obviously I wasn't there, but um, from what I've read, it seems they thought they were making a good choice on paper based on his capabilities of what he did at Rentham. But unfortunately, Dr. McPherson had forged such a close relationship with the people of Belchertown that when he relinquished his post, Dr. Tadgell was never able to maintain that same level of communication and just openness with the town. Um, when Dr. McPherson was superintendent, he had the support of every organization in town. He was a member of the church. Um, he and his, his right-hand man, who strangely enough was not his assistant superintendent, it was his dentist, Dr. Westwell. Dr. Westwell was president of the VFW in Belchertown. They, um, he actually served on their school committee as well. The two were very, very involved in the town. So when Dr. McPherson fell ill and found that he had to retire, Dr. Westwell ended up moving out to the Midwest and taking a position as a superintendent at another state school. So Dr. Tadgell walked into this vacuum of sorts, this void that was left by um, Dr. McPherson's retirement. And Dr. McPherson did stick around for a couple of years to try to help um, Dr. Tadgell kind of slide into the position, but it just didn't work. And then Dr. McPherson sadly passed away. So Dr. Tadgell was on his own and he was struggling. Um, it was the dawn of World War II and everything on the campus was affected they were no longer able to invite the town to all of their events because there just wasn't the space and the money and there also wasn't the staffing most of the male staff had been called away to serve um, and <clears throat> it put a huge dent in the relationship between the state school and the town and it's something that the school never recovered from unfortunately with this change in staffing because of the war change in funding conditions at the state school also started to decline Henry Tadgell ended up serving until, the 19, until 1959 and was replaced in 1960 by Dr. Bowser. Um, and 1960 is kind of like the line of demarcation where the state school went from being um, a point of pride for the town of Belchertown to a thorn in their side. Um, and unfortunately, the book only covers up until 1960 when Dr. Bowser took over, uh, but he was not ready for this job at all. Um, thankfully though, he was backed by a massive volunteer force. A lot of the parents had gotten together while Tadgell was superintendent and they realized that there were things that the state was not going to help out with. So they stepped in and did it instead um, with the help of the Westover Wives Club. So a lot of the military wives that lived on Westover Air Force Base came in to help support um, things like continuing to celebrate birthdays and holidays and being able to throw parties. They bought televisions for the wards. They sponsored trips to different places, including Red Sox games um, and trips to the Big E. Um, in this picture, they are actually collecting stamp books 
because they were going to buy a birthday bus that would help all of the residents celebrate their birthday. They could go on trips. Um, there was a birthday box also where um, they would collect birthday cards for residents each time it was their birthday so that they would always get something. Um, and these volunteers worked really hard to also keep up the conditions on the campus. They painted the infirmary um, with a cute little flower garden. Um, and they often did a lot of the repairs in the buildings that the state should have been shouldering, but instead the volunteers were taking care of it. It's the only reason that I believe Dr. Bowser lasted as long as he did is because he had that volunteer force behind him. But it was clear that he just wasn't up to the task. And in the 1970s, a number of letters and petitions circulated calling for his resignation, and he did indeed resign. Around this time too, the original Belchertown State School Friends Association was formed. Um, it had been in um, operation since 1954, but around the time that Bowser took over is when Dr. Ben Ricci was elected president of the Belchertown State School Friends Association. And the friends decided that it was time for them to take on a little bit more of a political stance when it came to the state school and the conditions there. And here's the reason why not only were conditions deteriorating, but there were a number of unexplained deaths at the state school. It was clear that many of the residents were suffering from neglect and abuse. Um, in many of the buildings, there were not working fire alarms. There was, in the infirmary, only one way out of the building for the disabled people in a wheelchair, and that was an elevator, which you can't use when there's fire. That elevator was also used to transport trash at the same time that it was transporting the patient's food. There were rodent infestations, um, sewage backed up into the buildings. So in 1972, Ben Ricci sat down with attorney Beryl Cohen after having interviewed um, many other attorneys that just weren't up to the task. So he took, he took Beryl out to dinner at the Salem Cross Inn. They had dinner and over dessert, Ben blurted out that he wanted to sue the state of Massachusetts. And at that time, nothing like that had ever been done. No one had ever sued the state of Massachusetts. So Farrell Cohen wasn't entirely sure what that was going to look like, um, but he knew that Ben was right, something needed to be done. However, the original lawsuit was not intended to shut down the state school. The original lawsuit was intended to get the state to start paying attention and providing more oversight because the new superintendent, Milton Greenblatt, was left to his own devices and he was not a kind man, he was not empathetic, and he did not believe that these residents could ever go home. He believed that, he believed in, in the theory of out, of out of sight, out of mind for these individuals. And to him, it didn't matter that these folks came into Belchertown State School and stayed there for their entire lives. It didn't matter that they listed death as one of their top means of discharging individuals from the state school. Um, he was just one of those people that should never have been in human services. Um, if any of you work in human services, I'm sure you have run into plenty of these people over the years who are in this field because they have some sort of complex or some sort of control issues that they need to fulfill. And Milton Greedblatt was one of those. So. Ben and Beryl stayed up until two o'clock in the morning. They typed up a 42 page complaint that detailed all of the issues on the campus, including things like the toilets not having toilet seats. There were no partitions between the toilets. There were no partitions around the showers. So everything was done in a group. There was no privacy and none of the patients were allowed to have personal items. Um, it was a very um, warehouse type feel. Beds were stacked head to foot. Um, if you have read the book or are planning to read the book, you'll see some photos of that overcrowding um, and that very sanitized institutional look that the state school eventually took on. Um, so the lawsuit was finalized in 1974 with the Ricci Consent Decree. And the Consent Decree essentially outlined the phased approach to improving the state school which they did. They did a wonderful job of improving it. But I say wonderful because that is comparatively speaking. 
all of the things that they instituted at the state school between 1974 and the time it closed in 1992 were things that should have already been happening, things that should have been best practice at the state school but weren't. So the folks who started working there in the 70s, because they did do a major clean out of staff and they did hire a lot of new folks, things like regular occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, giving the patients wheelchairs that actually adjusted to them specifically instead of um, just buying regular wheelchairs that didn't adjust at all. Getting patients out of bed, taking them for walks, getting them out and about around campus were things that should have already been happening. So <clears throat> it became clear that the state school was something that just couldn't be saved. It couldn't be completely turned around enough to justify its existence. And this was also the time of a push for community care in all institutions. So the deinstitutionalization movement was really picking up steam. Um, people were fighting for their individual rights and the right to live out in the community and live independently. So eventually that led to the phasing down of most services on the state school campus. The residents were taken out of the nursery, the infirmary and the big brick dorms. They were moved out into what used to be the staff housing and those houses were turned into apartments where they could learn how to live independently in preparation for going out into the community and living on their own. So 1992 rolls around and they closed down the campus completely, locked the doors, they had a closing ceremony, and then nothing happened. The campus sat vacant and sat and sat and sat. So this image of the schoolhouse is one of the first photos that I took in 2006 when I first saw the campus. So this is 13 years ago, 14 years ago now. And by the time I did get to see the inside of these buildings, this is a year later in 2007, I was floored by what was left behind. Um, there was so much life left in these buildings, pieces of these people that had come and gone, thousands of people that had you know, come through these buildings over the years. Um, you can see the ruined BSS that used to be in the middle of the, oops, sorry, technical difficulties again, um, the ruined tiles that were in the middle of the auditorium floor. And the decay in the buildings was just phenomenal. They had literally been left to rot. And they sat that way while the town debated many, many development proposals, including the possibility of a medium security prison, which obviously got voted down, um, and a couple of other suggestions, including an upscale spa and hotel. Um, and instead, the campus sat until 2006, when Bridgeland Corporation out of Chicago took over the property and started talking again about creating this high-end hotel and spa. And unfortunately, Bridgeland turned out to be a um, not, uh, not a very favorable choice for developers. It turned out that they were taking kickbacks, they were not paying their contractors, and the town had to take the campus back because it was clear no development was going to happen. So again, the campus sat empty until 2017 when Mass Development partnered with the Belchertown Economic Development Industrial Corporation to start developing the property. By developing, it meant demolition. <clears throat> So today there are 12 buildings left on campus, including the administration building, um, the Tagel Nursery and a number of dorms, but they are in the process right now of demolishing the um, canteen building and the last few remaining dorms at the back of the campus. So very little of the original campus still exists. Um, however, <clears throat> we are working to save the administration building. We've revived the Belchertown State School Friends and we're working with Mass Development to find a development partner to hopefully turn the administration building into a museum and educational center where you can hear me talk anytime you want because by the time we get that open and running, I will most likely live there um, and just talk about the state school all day, every day, which is what I would like to do with the rest of my life anyway. Um, include, embedded in this presentation is also a video tour of the administration building, um, but since we're at 11.46 already, I'll have Desiree send out the link for that one as well so that you can see the tour through the administration building and what it looks like currently um, and kind of what we're up against with redeveloping it. Um, and of course, if you haven't already gotten the book, it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you can buy it direct from my publisher, Arcadia. 
However, you can also buy it direct from me if you would like a signed copy. Um, I can either deliver it to you or ship it um, because I have a whole box of them at home ready to sign and send out if you are interested in the copy. And that's it. I'm only two minutes over 45 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. That was amazing. Um, wow. <laughs> Let me uh, let me bring up my my face again. Hi. <laughs> um, the there was a couple of questions that did pop up. Um, yeah. One was it was more talk. Um, the doctors advise some parents just to drop their children or infants off and just forget about them. Yes. Why why would the doctors say that? Why would they do that? So that was something that started in the late 1950s, early 1960s when they. The theories about child rearing and parenting um, changed drastically. And doctors believe that the reason that children came out with disabilities was because there was something wrong with their parents. So um, usually they called mothers like refrigerator mothers. They said, oh, your child's disabled because you're cold and, and you can't care for them. So through that came the theory that the best thing for your child is for you to drop them off never see them again, don't think about them, don't contact them, they'll be better off with us, because clearly you as a parent did something wrong for your child to be disabled. And that's where that whole thing came from. And unfortunately, that, that kind of overrode uh, special education for many years and until the 1970s, which is mind blowing when you think about it, that we spent 20 to 30 years blaming parents for their children's disabilities and telling them that the only way to fix their children was for them to separate from their children and for the, the children to never know their home and never know their parents. Um, it's kind of a very frightening view of children with disabilities. My mother, who, as Kate and Catherine knows, is deaf and she went to the Berkeley School for the Deaf in California. And originally she's from Rio del California, which is four, uh, 250 miles away from Berkeley. And when I spoke to my grandmother about it, why did you send my mother to a deaf school? She would say, I was told I had to. I was told that there was nothing they could do. And this was back in the 60s. So I'm just saying that, uh, for, and she always said she wished she fought harder to keep her home. And I think a lot of parents were just, they assumed, and that was the, I think for the time that the doctor knew best. Yes. Yep, and, and parents, I, parents had no rights either, which was right. uh, very difficult. If the state stepped in and said, your child belongs here, there was nothing that parents could do. And especially if they had the backing of, of a medical professional, that was, the decision was law. Um, the next question was, so you're in the process of, because there was so much information, yeah. Um, your, your book only goes up to 1960. Yeah. Um, and you said you find out sometime in February if it'll be the next we step. Do. We do. So yeah, to answer Paul's question, knock on wood. it stops at 19. Yeah, knock on wood, definitely. Um, it stops at 1960 because we had such a massive collection that we were able to use. Um, most of the photos that are in the book came from a private collection uh, of a man named Don Lebrecht, who I think some of you in this, this group definitely know. Um, he was a regional trainer for the Department of Mental Retardation uh, for 30 years. And um, he was an avid state school historian. And he firmly believed that we couldn't move forward in caring for folks with disabilities if we didn't know the history behind it. So he collected everything he could get his hands on. Um, and I was the, the lucky recipient of um, his archive, which is what mostly makes up this book. But because the state school history is so complicated, it's hard to jam it all into these tiny books because Arcadia gives you a page limit, unfortunately, and a photograph limit, which I far exceeded in this book. Um, they did give me some leeway to put in more images than you're supposed to. Um, so they're gonna look at the sales numbers in February, which thankfully my Amazon sales rank is soaring every day. So I'm hoping that they say yes to a second volume. If not, I'll put it out myself so that everybody gets to see the rest of this collection. The library has it. We're very excited about it. Uh, like I said, as soon as I saw that it was out, I went over to my director and said, guess what we're getting? So, <laughs> so we have that. We're in the process of processing it. Um, yep. 
couple other questions that came up was one person explained about how in the early 60s a parent had a lot of children and they went yeah. and said these children are difficult etc obviously yeah. there was really nothing wrong with these children so mm -hmm. could you explain a bit about the admissions process then since so the, the admissions process was kind of all over the place um you could get referred by your own parent could say I need the help and you know take the child to the institution you could be re referred by your pediatrician you could be referred by child welfare the schools could refer the student um, it, if there was a police matter that the child could get referred but um, to I think that was um, that was Chris that said that and or, yep a lot of times if um, there was a woman who was unwed or a woman whose family was not financially able to care for the number of children that they had, many times they, they would be sent to Belchertown. And it was generally the female children because they didn't want the female children to do the same things that the mother was doing and end up being a welfare drain. There are actually mentions um, in some of the paperwork where there are notes made as to whether or not they expected the children to also grow up to be welfare recipients. Um, so a lot of it was them attempting to stop the cycle of um, reliance on social services. And it the sounds state, very familiar. Yeah, the state school became kind of a conduit for trying to figure that out because we no longer have poor houses. Right. So the state schools kind of stepped into that void, as did the state hospitals. So a lot of the insane right. asylums also ended up with folks that didn't belong there. Why? Why do you think, at least in this area, Belchertown became, state school became such a catch-all for everyone? Because it was the only thing that was available. Um, before before the, the Department of Youth Services system really got up and running, there were reform schools, but most of the, all of the reform schools were in Eastern Mass. So Belchertown ended up kind of being everything because most folks in Massachusetts think that Massachusetts ends at 290, forget there's more state out here. So they kind of left us with only three choices. We had this, the TB hospital in Westfield, which actually took a lot of patients that didn't have TB. We had the state hospital in Northampton, and we had the state school in Belchertown. They kind of served all purposes because we didn't have the same resources as the eastern part of the state. Do you think that is why the decline truly happened? Besides, obviously, the um, director, the uh, superintendent didn't sound like a very um, nice person. Uh, I'm putting that mildly. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> the but on top of it, uh, lack of resources, but also uh, the fact that it was a catch all and there's only so much you can do when you're trying to yeah. com compartmentalize, essentially. Do you think that's why it deteriorated so quickly as it did? Absolutely. I mean, there was a lack of funding and too many people, too many people with, with too many varying issues that needed to be dealt with. And when you take an institution that is overpopulated and understaffed, no matter what you do, you will end up with the types of conditions that happened at Belchertown. Unfortunately, when you put human beings in charge of another group of very vulnerable human beings, and you don't give them the resources to remain humane in their care of these people, this is what happens. Yeah. Um, one, one of the patrons there says, what about Munson Developmental Center, AKA State Hospital, State School? Um, so Munson Developmental is in a whole other um, realm because Munson started out as a hospital for epileptics and an orphanage. They didn't become a state school slash developmental center until much later in their development. And while there were some reports of neglect and other issues at Munson, it wasn't as widespread as Belchertown. And they received a lot of Belchertown patients after the state school closed because Munson actually remained open for um, many, many years after Belchertown closed because they were serving as a regional developmental center, which changed their entire administrative structure. Um, so they're, they're very different. Um, okay from Belchertown. So last two questions. What happened to the carousel? Um, the carousel was parted out and sold. Um, 
we did find, we tracked down one of the carousel horses that um, the owner is actually willing to donate once we get our museum up and running. So we will have one of the original horses. Um, cool. It will come, come live with us, I hope. <laughs> Very cool. And then the second question I had was, um, is there any books or any place where you can find information about people who actually attended BSS? Yes, and Something I'm really glad that, that Catherine asked that question because we have um, the amazing Ed Orzakowski. Oh, yeah, uh, he Alex just posted Zoom something. <laughs> um, and Ed's book, you'll like it here, is the story of Donald Vickis, who was a patient at Belchertown. Um, okay. And it's a phenomenal book. It gives you a um, more human view into what life at Belchertown State School was like. Um, and because uh, Donald was there in the 1960s. He was there at the height of the abuse and neglect, and you can definitely see the incredible decline of the state school through Donald's eyes, and it's, it's an incredible story, um, and Donald was an incredible person, so you had an opportunity to kind of see um, what happened, how the system broke down and how the system didn't care for him, but because of the type of person that Donald was, he went on to live a very full life. His wife, uh, Pat, is one of our hugest supporters, um, both mine and Ed's, and it's, he's left behind, Donald has left behind an incredible legacy, so definitely get Ed's book, um, and Ed's also writing another book about a female patient, so um, definitely anything that Ed writes, you definitely want to get it. <laughs> um, the other, I guess, popped in my head, quick question, is uh, what happened to those who were still at the school when it was closed? Uh, most of them went out into community housing. They arranged for um, either group home type settings or independent living. Um, like Ruth, Ruth Sinkowitz Mercer and her husband Norman, for instance, um, were moved out into an apartment in Chestnut Towers and they were able to live independently um, until Ruth's passing. Uh, and most, most folks went out into independent living, but there were a number of group homes that that were set up. I have to say that the closure of Belchertown and the movement into community treatment was very well done. Um, unlike okay. the deinstitutionalization of the mental health facilities. Okay, the, the I was closure, just gonna ask. Okay. Yeah, the closure okay. of Belchertown was very well done. The money was there, the planning was there. Um, two individuals, Paul and Ann Shelton were, um, Paul and um, Judy Shelton were instrumental in helping to move these patients out and make their transition into community housing successful and their daughter Anne now runs um, a, a center that does art therapy for folks with disabilities most of whom are former Belchertown residents. Excellent. Well thank you so very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, it looks like everyone else here had a really good time. Uh, like I said I'll be sending out um, the recording but I will also be sending out any of the videos uh, from the show that hasn't been shown because of audio issues but they'll definitely be worth checking out and i'll also make put down links for the different uh books that were recommended in this and okay. i love i love when people reach out to me so please if you had questions that didn't get answered today feel free to email me you can find us at bssfriends.org um, there's also a Belchertown State School Facebook page that's dedicated to um, the book and Don LeBrecht's collection where we share a lot of um, historical stuff and lots of stories. You'll find lots of former staff members who are um, on that page and lots of ways to connect. So please don't hesitate to connect with us. We, we really like that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us on this fine Saturday morning. Uh, I understand it's supposed to be beautiful the next day or so. So please yep. get out, enjoy your weekend. And thank you all for coming. Have a great, have a great weekend.